Hey, everybody. Welcome back to The Pylon Show. This is number 68, and we have a very special show here today. We've been trying to get together for a while. We have none other than Grant Davies on the show. You can follow him on Twitter at Grant the Ant. Grant is basically the guy who programs StarCraft Remastered. Uh, how are you doing here today, Grant? I'm great, and thanks for having me back on The Pylon Show, my second appearance. That's um, right. I've upgraded my chair for the second appearance. I've now got this kind of thrown sofa thing going on. Yeah. So it's great to be here. Yeah. For the people who don't remember, he was on the uh, BlizzCon episode with us last year. That was a lot of fun with Jeff and Sean and myself. Uh, and this time I have uh, Rapid also joining me here as he is just uh, completely intertwined with StarCraft Remastered at this point. Uh, and yeah, we're just going to kind of do a fun little interview with Grant here and go over some StarCraft Remastered stuff. So I hope you're ready for our hard-hitting questions here, Grant. Absolutely. I'm ready to deflect everything. I've also <laughs> got my uh, I've also got my attorney to the side here, Shermanator, uh, producer <laughs> extraordinaire on StarCraft Remastered. So uh, if you hear someone yelling something out for me to say, that's that's just the, the, the voice of Shermanator. And he's, yeah. he's got one hand on the power cable, so... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it hand blacks hand out, you know that... He's going to yank it out. That's how you're going to know that we hit a soft spot there. Yeah, exactly. yeah. Uh, well, I think we should probably just open up. Earlier today, you made uh, an update, uh, one of these blue posts on the forums about the group matchmaking timeline. Uh, could you just go over that for us real quick? Sure. Yeah. So we've obviously wanted to do group, group matchmaking since we launched a couple of years ago. And last time I was on the Pylon show, actually, um, at BlizzCon, I had to push it from last year to this year. Unfortunately, it, it's not going to be this year. Uh, so the post was uh, really announcing that uh, it's not going to be this year. And um, although we're pushing hard to make that happen, uh, it, the pieces just haven't fallen together at the moment. So um, by way of some kind of explanation, I guess, uh, we are a small team. We're juggling a lot of priorities. And um, we're relying on other teams uh, to get that across the line. And even though we've made quite a decent amount of progress in the last year we haven't got to the point that we think we can release it this year so it's not great it's not the position that, that we want to be in but rest assured that it's a very high priority for us and it's something that we're, we're going to be pushing hard for okay well i mean sad to hear but understandable yeah and i just for everybody else out there when i was reading uh that announcement and some of the reactions to it um obviously uh even if you're frustrated by that, uh, and I saw some kind of frustrated posts, it's like, I want this already. It just kind of illustrates like how many people there are out there that uh, just want group match matchmaking because it is uh, like StarCraft is a game that is actually very fun uh, to play with your friends. And, uh, and so I'm, I'm, I'm super excited for that too. And I understand like it's, it's hard to accurately communicate in understandable ways, like all of the, the moving parts behind all of that. Uh, so I, I could tell when you were, when you were writing your, your announcement, I was just like, well, this is like basically the way, the only way that this is understandable to like the average person, instead of going into the, well, we need these 50 different teams and chunks from everywhere i can can only imagine how complicated that is to orchestrate everything yeah b believe me the scr team as much as anyone wants to deliver this feature it's a feature that we're super excited about so uh yeah you know it's uh, it's it's not great news for, for for me to have to deliver but that's the reality of the situation unfortunately mm -hmm. okay well, um I I was just going to kind of segue that into, so that's sort of like the next big feature that uh, is coming out, the group matchmaking. I think everybody like really, really is looking forward to that. But there's actually been a lot of different features that have been added to StarCraft over uh, the course of the, I think, two something years since its release. So I just, my question was going to be uh, if you have either some anecdotes or maybe to talk about some specific challenges, because you guys have added like 64 bit uh, support, uh, EUD, like the ladder itself, just to implement all of that. Like, uh, how, like, to, to me, that seems like just basically uh impossible like so intractably difficult so what has it been like to overcome like so many like challenges to extend and upgrade like such an old game to add all of these cool new feature features to it yeah well it, it turns out that uh remastering a product is not as simple as just adding a fresh coat of paint to it uh there are a lot of challenges like you say and uh you hit on the idea of the ladder and, and the matchmaker uh, that was a really interesting challenge for us because 
a global matchmaker is not something that's been done at Blizzard before. <laughs> and um, we, we, when we came together to, to remaster StarCraft, we were very committed to the idea of doing a, a truly global matchmaker because we felt that if we didn't do a global matchmaker, it, it wasn't going to be good for that community outside of Korea. I mean, most of our players are obviously in Korea, but we still wanted to sustain the community outside of Korea. Mm -hmm. And so we, we faced a number of challenges and, and there was no one really else to go to at Blizzard to talk to about some of these challenges because we haven't really done it before. So uh, one example is our very first iteration of it was really based on geodistance. Um, you know, geodistance approximates latency. Well, that works fine within one country, but when you expand that globally, it doesn't work so well. And one specific example of that was uh, going from Europe to Korea, that matchup, when you look at it and you say, well, it's not really that far in distance between the two countries, but actually the, the data, the packets need to wind their way through so many countries in Europe and then countries in Asia as well. And turns out there's a huge amount of packet loss when that happens. So we're finding that a lot of the packets were routing all the way around the other side of the world in the other direction because it was faster to go that way than to, to go through uh, <laughs> wow. those countries. So that was a learning experience. Uh, you know, it's apparently faster to go under the ocean than to go through uh, all these countries, which I guess makes sense. You've just got the tyranny of distance there. But uh, there were a bunch of learning experiences uh, involved in that for us to get to, to the matchmaker of where it is today. Um, you talked about 64-bit. That was another very interesting challenge. Uh, um, there was one thing I remember with 64-bit. I was working on a bug that was a desync with uh, Mac on 64-bit. And uh, after tracking this code for hours and hours, it turned out that there was just one line of code in the pathfinding code, actually. and uh, code that in 1998 or 1999 when it was written probably wasn't so bad because 64-bit wasn't a thing. But when you look at it through the lens of 64-bit today, you're like, oh my God, like it was, uh, it was a real uh, thing for us to trip up on. And um, you know, the funny thing about 64-bit at the end of it, it's such a long, intricate, complicated uh, uh, thing to implement. But at the end of it, the best result for us is that the player doesn't notice any difference whatsoever. Mm. So it's kind of a it's kind of a thankless task in that way. <laughs> like, oh, we've done it. There's no difference whatsoever from 32 bit. Cool. Um, yeah, I definitely can't tell the difference. So <laughs> yeah, well, that's so a good, good job. <laughs> yeah. So that's a good outcome. And EUD is actually one of the more complicated things as well. You know, this uh, this exploit where people could write to anywhere in the StarCraft process memory um, and created some really crazy, awesome content. But that also allows people to write some stuff that's not so nice, some more malicious stuff. So we had to shut that down, but also try to bring back the EUD. And that was a very complicated imp implementation where we essentially emulated what it was doing uh, in the last 20 years. Uh, you know, jumping back to what you were mentioning about the, the routing for like Europe to Korea and everything and trying to keep the scene outside of Korea alive. I wonder how do you... Uh, look at like the different viewpoints of the different areas and kind of balance these into the way that you make the global matchmaking work. Like for instance, obviously uh, if, if you talk to the players that live in Europe, for instance, uh, they need to hit some Korean players to, you know, fill out their, their ladder games. They can't just play against each other or it would go inactive. Uh, but of course, you know, the Koreans would be, happier playing like lower turn rates. It's like you don't necessarily need to hit a European player if you're playing from Korea. Uh, how, how do you make that work out for the matchmaker? Like how do you balance that, like the location versus matching against your same MMR, that type of thing? Yeah, so uh, you're right. There, there is a balancing act and that's something that we've, we've iterated on a lot over the, uh, the last couple of years. Um, and what we've tried to do is get to the point where the experience in Korea is diluted very slightly to the point where one in every uh, certain amount of games, maybe one in every 10 to 20 games is a little bit less than what Korea are used to, which is turn rate 20, 24. So they might play at turn rate 16 or 14 for one of those games. But just that small percentage of games in Korea allows a very high percentage of games outside of Korea to be played with Koreans and at a higher turn rate. So, you know, I guess an acceptable turn rate or a good turn rate in Korea is 20, 24, uh, at least 16, uh, a good turn rate outside of Korea might be a lot lower than that. So it's a matter of finding that balance where we're mm. providing good matches for people outside of Korea where they can match with Koreans, but also not uh, destroying the experience uh, for people in Korea. Mm. 
And, and then also, I mean, you've uh, you know launched StarCraft Remastered in China now, so I can only imagine how adding that into uh, the servers that you support has kind of changed all of that around as well, right? Yeah, a little bit, but actually China is kind of segregated because it's it's mm -hmm. uh, the, there's the firewall of China, right? So we treat China as a separate region at the moment. Uh, maybe uh, there's a future world where we can better integrate that so that everybody's playing together. But at mm -hmm. the moment, that's the one case where it's not truly global and it's uh, it's regional. Okay. Is there a, just a, uh, something that just came to mind? Is there any way for me to get on the Chinese server? <laughs> like, I would like <laughs> to go over there and just play a couple games, see how good they are. <laughs> Is there? Well, I think you need a uh, Chinese Battle.net account to get uh, access to that. I'm not sure how easy that is to do if you're not in China. Uh, you might need an ID. I think like you need an ID to get a Korean account, right? Or maybe they've changed that now. But at some point, I think you did. You can play on Korea, but yeah, like I, I have a Korean account and everything. But yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, that might not be so easy. No, no, I guess not. Okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, uh, actually... I have a question about how the ladder system uh, works as far as points go, because I thought I knew, and then you started revealing MMR. And so uh, I feel like the point system, how does it really work? Is there like, are there streaks involved beyond, uh, like obviously when you're doing your, your uh, placement matches, I'm sure that that's streaking you up and down very quickly with higher MMR. But sometimes I feel like, if I've won a bunch of games in a row, I'm winning more points, and if I've lost more in a row, I'm losing more points. Do you have streaks involved with that? No, there, sh there shouldn't be any streaks. It should be um, pretty much an ELO system, um, mm -hmm. like what other matchmakers have, and they're using chess, for example, uh, which means it's a zero-sum game. So if we're playing each other and you win and I lose, uh, you get the points that I've lost, essentially. That's one uh -huh. way to think of it. Um, okay. So there's, there shouldn't be streaks like you see in Hearthstone, for example, where you get the extra star for winning uh, three in a row or whatever. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. But the, the one difference from ELO that you've hit on is in the grading games, the five grading games that we play. We do actually mm. apply a multiplier during that, and that multiplier changes as the games wow. continue because we want to move you rapidly up and down the, the grades so mm. that we can find the most appropriate place as quickly as possible. Okay. okay. Uh, so like so many things in StarCraft 1, I find out it's just in my mind. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to kind of add to that and kind of ask a question about the ELO normalization that happens at the uh, end of the season. Like what, before you play your placement matches, is there just like where, how do you, how do you figure out where a player needs to go based on you know, their previous performances? Yeah. So there's an ELO or MMR that's associated with your Battle.net account. And then ah, there's okay. MMR associated with your individual profiles. Um, okay. So, we kind of take a, uh, you can think of it as maybe an in-between value of the, the individual profile and the Battle.net account. And that's also like what you've hit on. It, it, it helps us uh, from where you were in the previous season, but it also helps us in the case where someone's going to smurf and start a new account. <laughs> um, and we know that they're like an S rank player and then they want to get to F rank. We can go, well, actually, we know that you're an S rank player. So let's move you up a little bit. Okay, because I've seen a lot of the Korean players, they'll do like a zero to hero stream or whatever, where they make a very low MMR account or they'll make another uh, you know, account and try to like smurf up from there. And it's like, okay, so it's not quite starting from all the way at zero. Yeah, I mean, I guess they could start an entirely new Battle.net account, uh, pay another 15 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, excellent. Um you know, it, I guess while we're still kind of on this competitive uh, aspect, how do you guys go about picking uh, the ladder map pool? I know that you've uh, mentioned in the past, like, for instance, you like to keep in Fighting Spirit and Circuit Breakers for the more amateur players. But just what's the overall, like, uh, way that you look at this? Yeah, so this is very much in the domain of uh, Shermanator over here. He does, uh, he does a lot of the, the ladder pool stuff. So I'll I'll speak about it as what I think happens, and he can yell at, yell at me. Sure. If, uh, <laughs> uh, but so we're in contact with a whole bunch of people from around the world um, who give us feedback about the maps. Um, we're in contact with map makers in Korea. We're in contact with uh, Freakling in Germany, for example, makes a lot of maps. We're in contact with uh, Sinsanity, who does uh, SCM Draft. And people like Kix, for example, who has an encyclopedic <laughs> knowledge of every map that's ever uh, been released on StarCraft. And, Please, please don't listen to him for maps. Yeah, I was just saying, every once in a while, <laughs> Kix will send me this message, and he'll be like, I just told you know Sherman that we should add all these maps. And I look through the maps, and I'm like, like, Kix, nobody 
like oh my no god this is to play neo arkanoid thank you very much <laughs> <laughs> oh my god well somehow <laughs> trespass made it through so you know we got to make some concessions there but uh okay well i'm glad you're taking a lot of feedback from that yeah. but yeah, please we, continue we get, Grant. yeah we get a bunch of feedback and um and we try and uh, balance it per race so that it's not too heavily skewed for one race obviously we want to have a little bit in there for everyone um Geminator also balances per tile set so that we're not just focused on one tile set uh, and then another thing we do is, uh, is obviously play the maps in house. Um, not that we're playing at the pro level, but, uh, we're playing basically every iteration of maps that, uh, the map makers and freaklings send through. And, um, then that gives an opportunity for us to give feedback. And the way I approach that is if I lose that map, that should be removed from the pool forever. And if I win, <laughs> that's, uh, <laughs> oh, that's excellent. The, <clears throat> Um, actually, how did you decide, like, for instance, to work with Freakling? I feel like he's made some great maps. We've never really had non-Korean made maps that I can recall used in the actual pro scene before. But like, for instance, he seems to be a great map maker. How did you come across someone like him to, to help out with that? Yeah, well, that one I might have to confer with my attorney here to get some information about that. Do <laughs> okay. you have a comment about that one? Sure, yeah. I mean, I really wanted to get, like, some of the Korean or the non-Korean map makers involved in the process. And, you know, I had been a fan of Freakling's maps for about, you know, five years or so. And so I reached out to him and a few of the other folks that constantly post on Team Liquid. And, you know, we've also had, you know, maps from other foreigners uh, map boys at this point. But yeah, it's more like I just wanted to get non-Koreans involved and I, I uh, respect Freakling's map making ability quite a bit. Yeah, it's made some great maps. Yeah. Oh, very cool. Very cool. Thank you. Thank you to the Matt Sherman, the yeah. lawyer off screen. The voice yeah. from the, the, voice <laughs> from the void. Yeah. I don't know. yeah. <laughs> he's the he's the uh, the adjutant for uh, for Grant. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. No, I I was actually remember reading a couple of posts on the Korean forums uh, when you first added maps uh, made by Freakling to this map pool um, because obviously the Korean uh, players are very uh, you know. It, very well versed in the Korean made maps that are so popular. Uh, but uh, they were just like, wait a second, this, there's non-Korean map makers and they do all these cool maps. And it's actually like uh, the reception was super positive. So uh, it's definitely um, cool to see all that representation. Um, I, uh, I think my, uh, my question was less um, about the uh, like past of, of StarCraft Remastered and more of like kind of what's coming up. I mean, obviously the uh, uh, group uh, matchmaking is sort of the big thing uh, on the horizon, um, but I, I I don't know what the timeline of Brood War has looked like. But uh, what are some of the the big things that you know might be uh, still in the in the pipeline? If I can you know ask for uh, teasers. Yeah, well, I mean, a lot of the stuff that we've uh, that we're focusing on is in that uh, 2019 priorities thread that's on uh, that's on our forum, and we've knocked off a bunch of uh, issues from that thread over the year, and uh, there's maybe one or two more that we're focusing on. Obviously, a lot of effort at the moment is going into the group matchmaking, even though it's not ready to release this year. That's a lot of our focus still is being put into that. Um, a lot of effort this year has gone into 64-bit. Uh, we're still iterating on the color changes that we made. Um, there was some feedback on that. So yeah. we still want to keep mm -hmm. moving forward on that and seeing if we can get to a happy yeah. medium for everyone. Cool. Color uh, changes. Did, did people have something wrong with that? That was like amazing. I love these new colors. Well, I think at least the biggest issue that I've encountered is that now you can have like, it, when you, whenever you add more of a spectrum to the colors, you have to add colors that are then closer together. So several of the games, if you don't make the map in top versus bottom mode, where you can shift tab to change to red versus blue, you can have like white versus light gray. Uh, and I'm I just saying you. like, okay. I'm not going to cast that game. Okay. <laughs> if I have to cast a white Archon versus a light gray Archon. Mm-mm. Yeah, so one of the changes that we're profiling at the moment that we're trialing is uh, we'll rule out similar colors. So if someone cho chooses the, the white, as you say, then the, the gray would be, would be ruled out for anyone else to be able to. Uh. There's other issues as well. Like for example, the, uh, the cyan color is very similar, to, well, identical <laughs> to the minerals. So um, yeah. that's something we want to remove as well. Uh, so there's a, there's a couple of changes that we want to try and just see how that works with the community and then uh, and we can circle back to it then. 
Yeah, I, and I noticed that also right as you added the new colors to the maps, um, previously uh, neutral uh, objects on the map used to show up on the mini map as like a block of, of color. But now I, I don't, uh, at least there, there are some instances where that uh, hasn't uh, been happening. Is that like a conscious change or is that just something that I'm uh, noticing with the color change? I don't think that was a, co a conscious change. Maybe it might depend on the game type, but uh, okay. I don't know. Perhaps you've highlighted a bug that we need to go have a look at. <laughs> okay, well, I'll uh, <laughs> submit a, a more official thread about that uh, later on. <laughs> uh, but definitely want to keep things moving along. Sorry for monopolizing that for a moment. Uh, well, I mean, speaking about bugs, Grant. Oh, boy. Um, okay. There have been, like, since StarCraft Remaster came out, there have been so many new bugs that have come out. Uh, like we have the total recall where you can recall way more units than we've ever seen before. Uh, we have the, the thing where vultures can now lay mines, then instantly shoot with a hold position command. Uh, we have the hallucinations where you can make a hallucination and a high Templar into an archon. Uh, we have the new, the building scout bug where for some reason, oh. someone was attacking a building and canceled it and found out where their opponent was. I mean, it's, absolute madness how many bugs have been discovered since the kind of reinvigoration of the scene due to starcraft remastered what is your guys's view on all these bugs coming up and if you have any opinions or plans on if you should do anything about them or let them be or what yeah so our general policy with this is wait and see <clears throat> and i think you mentioned the total recall and that's a good example of where we did decide to wait and see Initially, there tends to be a bit of panic when this comes up, like it's going <laughs> to break everything and the balance yeah. is going to be thrown off. And, and, and that's understandable, but, but we found with Total Recall, when we did wait and see, it hasn't really uh, transpired that the balance seems mm. to have thrown off at all. And in fact, we saw it used in a, in a, in a pro game, right? Uh, I think it was movie uh, against Sharp, maybe. Uh, yeah, I, I believe that Total was. Recall. And that was a cool moment. Uh, that yeah. was cool to see. So I'm, I'm glad that we haven't taken any action to patch that stuff out yet when we have those nice moments um the other one you mentioned with the uh the visibility bug that was recently discovered that's one that could potentially be uh exploitative <laughs> so uh, we actually have investigated that and um i actually have a fix for it on a separate branch but again it's a wait and see scenario for us because when you do make these fixes to gameplay there's a certain risk that you can break other stuff that's not obvious i mean mm. again this code is very old um, the code is modifying all kinds of global state. It's, it can be very non-obvious and, and it's complicated to make uh, changes without uh, definitively saying that you're, you're not breaking stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, so in saying that, I think there's bugs that the community agree and in professional gaming as well that are just bugs and they can't be used. They're not allowed. I see no problem with us trying, looking at those and, and patching some of those out if everybody mm -hmm. agrees that, hey, they shouldn't be used and it's not fair to use them. Um, mm. that's something that hasn't been a high priority up until now, but I, I see, I have no philosophical objection to, uh, to us patching those out at some point. Yeah. yeah I, it, oh, I was just going to say, it's hard to kind of draw an objective line about when to be like really heavy handed. Cause I, uh, saw people on both sides of specifically the recent bug with being able to scout your opponent through fog of war by attacking a building as it's being destroyed or, uh, and I, uh, I think that at least so far, it's been pretty fortunate that there's a clear line where things are totally broken or not uh, broken. But is that, is that a problem with the, wait, has that been there this entire time or is that just a new thing that's coming with StarCraft Remastered? No, none of them are new to StarCraft Remastered. They're all okay. reproducible in, in going back to prior to StarCraft Remastered. They just haven't been found. Um, Blows my mind. Yeah. But, but here's, my, here's my yeah. counter argument to the... Uh, to the uh, visibility bug at the moment. Um, if, you, uh, if you click on the portrait before the other person has built something, it actually crashes your game, right? So <laughs> <Does> it? <laughs> is, it's balanced, right? It's balanced because the other person just has to wait and not build something and then your game crashes, they get an instant, instant win. So That's crazy, I didn't know that, that's amazing. Yeah. Oh my God. Whoa, that's the real, okay, so like the day that that bug came out, on Circuit Breakers, the four-player map, I had someone proxy gay outside my main. I'm like, he did it, I know. And then I went to the replay, he didn't, he just guessed. So it was like, oh my God. Nice. But it's good to know that there is a strong, strong counter to that. Yeah, there's an easy counter, just do nothing. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> just... I love that. I've been waiting my whole life for just doing nothing to be a counter to something. No, <laughs> finally, it's all paying off. Um, and I, I think specifically, maybe we can dive a little bit deeper on that one because I think uh, you know maybe a a lot of our viewers just have no idea what bug we're talking about, uh, and b I think the specificities of that bug are a little bit weird. So maybe you can shed some light on exactly like why does that happen? Because to me, I'm just like, how do you find this? This is so weird. Yeah. What, what's what's going who on is, there? Who is sitting in their StarCraft game attacking a pylon and canceling <laughs> it at the last second? Like, who's who's doing this? I don't even get it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how they managed to find that. I think it was Shine, uh, not Shine, uh, Scan who found it, I'm yeah, sorry. Scan finds a lot of these, actually. Yeah, Scan, I think Scan found it, and yeah. He's got I mean, too much time on his hands. <laughs> It's a weird anomaly about how units are recycled in the, in the code base in StarCraft. Um, and again, getting back to what I talked about with the global state, variables that are, that are hung over and, uh, and, and still pointing to something that they shouldn't be. So it's crazy. Wow. Wow. I love it. Um, that is, I, I'm, I think it's so cool that there's still new things being found about StarCraft. And most of them are not actually like super game changing. If they are, everybody's like, okay, well, just don't do that. Great. Um, <laughs> but uh, I don't see too many of them coming into uh, pro play. And, and so I think, you know, it's still being relatively uh, balanced. But I, I just kind of wondered when you guys think about the state of pro play, I mean, obviously, when you uh, take bugs away, that's that's one way to change it. But I think the other way to change pro play is uh, with the maps. And we talked about the the maps uh, a little bit earlier, but I was just kind of wondering if you guys have any sort of um, uh, thought about kind of the, the future of at least the tournaments coming up uh, and whether or not you like take input from, you said uh, some pro players and community figures, but do you actually uh, talk to like other tournament organizers to figure out, okay, well, here's the ladder map. So we're also going to make that uh, the map pool for this tournament. Cause I know KSL is coming up. I was just kind of wondering what the process for uh, aligning that was like. Mm. Yeah. That's probably more of a question for our esports department because they handle okay. a lot of the, the tournament stuff. Um, we don't have a huge involvement in in the ladder pools for the tournaments other than to try and bring some of those maps in so that people can play them on the ladder. Okay. Um, but I believe that at the very least, KSL and ASL are in constant communication as far as I'm aware. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, a, a more kind of general question. I know this could be a, a difficult one because a lot of people were playing on like private servers like Fish and everything before StarCraft Remastered came out. Hmm. But do you guys have any idea exactly how much more popular uh, StarCraft Brood War became with the release of StarCraft Remastered? Because at least in, in from my perspective, uh, it kind of like blew up again. Uh, you yeah. know, the Korean scene has become way more active. And obviously the foreign scene has this, this great place to play where you don't have to be a computer genius to get fish on your computer. <laughs> um, so I wonder if you guys have some sort of like estimate about how, how much better it's become basically yeah it's a good question and you're right that we don't have great stats on what the numbers were <clears throat> prior to remastered being released because people were playing on various third-party servers um so this is really just a guess and i would take this with a big grain of salt but um i think it may have doubled when we uh, released starcraft remastered and um, wow. the good the good news there actually is that we haven't seen much attrition at all since we released um the the, the player numbers have, have held pretty firm um so it's awesome i mean it's amazing that uh that, that people love the game so much that they'll, they'll they're playing day after day and and mm -hmm. nobody's leaving the game so it's great cool awesome uh hold on how much time do we have left i just want to make sure that we're About five minutes okay well one thing i wanted to touch on uh because i'm a i'm a huge uh, Grant fanboy is that uh, when I was going through uh, school, I was I obviously had the same thought that a lot of kids that play games and are going through school had. It's like it would be really cool to make games when I grew up. So I took a few computer science classes, and uh, I think I got like a C in one of them. I was like, whoops, this is not for me. Um, but obviously, Grant made it a little bit farther uh, than I did, and I'm sure that there are people watching this that are either going to school right now and love video games, or even maybe majoring in game design or something like uh, programming related uh, and I wondered if you could share some of your thoughts 
uh, about your uh, career and kind of what your mindset was that landed you where I'm sure a lot of people uh, are would really, really love to be someday as a programmer now for uh, StarCraft Remastered. What was that journey like for you, Grant? Yeah, I mean, I, I fell in love with uh, programming when I was seven years old, and that's uh, almost 35 years ago now, so uh, quite some time. But uh, I love it as much today as I ever have. Um, and the gaming side of thing, the game dev side of thing, is something I really fell into in my late teens. Um, it just, circumstance just brought me into working at a game development studio, and uh, I, I really liked it, so I, I kept working there. But as far as uh, what people can do to, to, to level up, I think... If you can work at, I'm a big advocate of working in, a small, in small teams, um, whether that's a small studio or, for example, here in, in Classic Games, we're a small team uh, on SCR. And the reason is that, that you get to wear many hats. You know, you, there's not a, a point where you can say, oh, well, I'll just hand this off to someone else. They can fix it. You know, you have to fix everything that's going on. You have to work on every aspect of the code base. And that gives you a really good familiarity and grounding with every aspect of building a game and putting a game together. Um, and that's something I've done throughout my career, uh, whether it was um, at the studio I had before, Blizzard, or even before that when I was working in, in much smaller uh, game dev studios. I think that's a great way to level you up really quickly. Cool. Uh, well, I've got one final question for you here, Grant, kind of a, uh, a question for your, your opinion. I know that you watch a lot of StarCraft Remastered Esports as well. You know, we've seen the state of the Korean scene really change a lot since StarCraft Remaster came out. You know, the uh, pro gaming is based off being a streamer plus playing tournaments at this point. Uh, you know, we've seen the domination of Flash. We've seen some cool stuff like the Moo Pro League pop up and everything. KSL has been fantastic. I just wonder if there's anything else that you, when you look at uh, the scene overall, like, is there anything that you wish would develop? Hmm. Um. I think if I could wave a magic wand uh, and, and choose anything, and maybe this is not realistic, but I'd love to see, uh, you know, we were talking a little bit off, off air about uh, your kids, Dan, and I'd love to see more of the younger generation embracing StarCraft. It is happening a little bit, but the reality is that there's so much to choose from in the world of gaming, and there's so much, uh, and StarCraft has this uh, brutally vertical learning curve. It's not the easiest game in the world, so I think that'd be awesome. You know, the... The reason I, I relocated from Australia and came to work in, at Blizzard on StarCraft was because of this idea of that Blizzard were, were trying to bring that back. And I thought mm -hmm. that was such an awesome experience for me <coughs> as, a, as a teenager playing StarCraft mm -hmm. that uh, I really wanted to bring that experience to a new generation and have them experience mm -hmm. what I did. Um, actually, if I can tell a, a boring uh, personal Please. anecdote <laughs> at this point, um, about, a, about a month after we launched StarCraft, uh, someone thought it was a good idea that I should return to Korea for a weekend to give a presentation. Um, so I, I did that. And um, after the presentation, I was just kind of walking around. And oh, yeah. <laughs> so this involved you two guys. You remember this. It's good. And I just stumbled on this tournament, right? This, this StarCraft tournament, as you do when you're in Korea. And yeah. which I think reinforces anyone who hasn't been to Korea doesn't truly understand how big StarCraft is in that country. Um, it, it was crazy. So we just stumbled onto this tournament. I sat down. I watched it. Uh, you two guys turned up when you were behind us and we turned around, well, okay, yep, because whenever there's a StarCraft tournament, there's uh, Tosis and Rapid. So. Uh, <laughs> but this story is not about who was behind me. It's about who was sitting in front of me in that tournament. And it was a father and son, and this kid was maybe like 10 years old, and they were both there watching this StarCraft Remastered tournament together and, and bonding over this experience and ex excitedly talking about it. Hmm. And you know, I was exhausted after, after months of uh, work on StarCraft. I was like, that's it right there. That's mm. the thing. That's what makes it mm. worth it. Um, mm. And I, I took a photo of that, actually. I sent it to some people at Blizzard, and that email and that photo wound its way up to Mike in the end. And that's the only inter interaction I've had with Mike, but it was great <laughs> that we, we had that moment to bring back StarCraft for people. So, yeah, if I could wave my magic wand, it would to, be to bring that experience to, to more of the younger generation and continue StarCraft for the next uh, 20, 50, 100 years. Well, that is awesome. I could not possibly agree more as my daughter has just started playing. Uh, well, I know that your time is running short, Grant. Thank you so much for the interview and for all your hard work on StarCraft Remaster. We really appreciate it. The game is absolutely fantastically. Thank you for having me on the show for the second time. And uh, thank you for your work on uh, 
streaming all the uh, wonderful KSL and ASL. I love, I love uh, watching there uh, and listening to the commentary. It's, it's, it's so fun. Thank, great. Thanks so much. All right, guys, we're going to go to a quick intermission. When we come back, the second part of the Pylon Show.